This is a fairly straight Habermasian, you know, this is another, another um, enlightenment idea. The social sphere, right? Where we all operate. We're all in the social sphere. And imagine there's a dimension of time, right, in this social sphere. This is a very confused diagram. In fact, this presentation is called Daddy Diagram, because when my children were young, they'd always go through my book saying, are there diagrams, right? So I was called Daddy Diagram. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the social sphere. And here's the past, and here's the future. So there's an axis going that way, through time. And this way is another axis. And this axis is moving from a realm of ideas and understanding to a realm of objects. Yeah? In English, you probably don't, don't know this uh, phrase, but um, engineers, um, anglophone engineers, talk about making something in the metal. So I'm afraid the eye tablet is made in the metal. Might be made out of plastic, it doesn't matter, right? It's always in the metal. I is real. So what we're doing here is we're moving from an incorporeal set of ideas, etc., etc., to a corporeal set of technologies, applications of those ideas in the metal. Yeah? I describe this, the body of ideas can be described as science. That is to say, it's understanding. Science in its more original meaning, yeah? So that science would include knowing that if you left your washing to dry on the rocks by the side of the river, in the sunlight, the colours would fade. That's science, right? It's knowing that if you put your ear to the ground in the steeps, you could hear the Tartar horde galloping towards you from miles away. Science, okay? Apart from obviously also being science, okay? Technology is what we call the application of that science in the metal. I think science works, this is to take an analogy with a fundamental idea in modern linguistics, in Chomsky and linguistics, but we, I won't bother to explain the connection, right? But I think the science is a sort of competence. It means you can do it. You understand something, yeah? And then the technology, taking that understanding and turning it into an object in the metal, is a performance. They talk about utterance or performance. It's, um, it, it's not, I mean, it's uh, de Sassur, for those of you that have done some linguistics, probably more than me. Now, what Chomsky brings to the table is the notion of transformation. Chomsky says, you know, you have pre-linguistic pre, um, ideas in your head, but we share a code. We don't share a code. I'm forcing you to use my code, I apologize. <laughs> I don't speak Portuguese, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've been taught my code. We share it, right? You have a competence in it, I have a competence in it. But me talking to you is an utterance, it's a performance. And of course in French the, the words are langue. We share the langue, English, and this is the parole, these are the words, right, okay? So what I'm saying is, there's a langue, which we can call science, okay? And there's parole, which we can call technology, right? And that what we have to talk about is how they get Transformed, right? What's the process of transformation? Now, the process of transformation is obviously somebody having the idea, okay? Which I call ideation, which is a neologism, but don't worry about it. Um, somebody has the idea. This produces what you can call prototypes, right? This produces a prototype of the technology. So you get various attempts to make the technology work. And sometimes these attempts go on forever, for centuries, certainly for decades. And sometimes you get prototypes which work very well, and sometimes you get prototypes which don't work very well. What does it take for a prototype to become 
an invention, another transformation. Here are these people making all these prototypes. <coughs> they are thrown, as we say, onto the rubbish dump of history. Nobody remembers them, etc., etc. But then, societies need the necessity, Browdell's accelerator, right? That necessity, supervening necessity, turns all of that, all that work of prototype, into an invention. <coughs> so I actually think that invention is, a, is, is really a, a very confusing word, because you're not really talking about invention. You're not talking about the eureka moment, you know. <gasps> you're not talking about that. You're talking about what we would call today systems engineering. You're putting together different bits that everybody knows about, but nobody's put together. And you're doing it in the context of the social sphere. So you now realize that the bits that have been lying about are actually going to be useful. Okay? And, uh, and that's when you get the invention. And that's why every one of these inventions, there are always a number of people involved. I mean, if you think about the cinema, forget it, right? It's the, it's the you know, it's the Landowski brothers in Berlin, Le Prince, who mysteriously fell off of a train in Paris, nobody really knows about him, Freeze Green in London, Thomas Edison in America, um, uh, and of course the Lumiere brothers, all 1895. As, as the most important of all French film critics, André Bazin once said, why 1895? No reason, I have a record, I found a record of a show, a few seconds, photographs of a couple dancing, moving, image shown to people, 1,600 people, in a big hall in Philadelphia in 1861, right? So, you know, why not 1861? Well, what happens between 1861 and 1895? The world becomes an urban space. You have a mass audience for the first time. The most important thing that happens in 1895 is that for the first time in American vaudeville theater, they're selling one million tickets a week. The time has come to mechanize the theatrical experience. Who invented the cinema? The audience invented the cinema, right? Or, invention is a terrible word, in other words, okay? 